So uh, my name is Susanne Raun and I'm professor and head of the research unit Movement, Culture and Society. And we're super happy to have this event with Philippa. Not least, just to say, and, and that is important for me to say in the beginning, that for our research unit, movement is at the heart of our research. Um, also recognizing that movement never happens in a vacuum. It is part of cultural and social uh, aspects of our life um, and also fundamental. So of course, I mean, uh, Philippa's book here, let me show you. I mean, it's obvious. We are so happy to have the possibility to, to present this talk with you and also thereby introduce the book. Yeah, it's a huge work, which is behind this, I know. Um, I know Philippa uh, from years back. Uh, I think it's more than, it's, it must be more than 10 years, Philippa, where you were at that time a convener of the working group in the International Federation of Theatre Research, the working group called Choreography and Corporeality. And uh, I learned so much. It, was, it has been so interesting to be part of this group, uh, not least uh, because of, of your way of convening the events together with uh, Thomas de France. So this is another way of saying this will be interesting because I know Philippe is a good presenter and she's a good listener and wants the discussion. The last nearly five years, you have, you have also been the honorary professor at our research unit, and you have visited uh, our university several times, uh, given talks, and uh, students have been quite enthusiastic about the presentations. And I know that this was part of the book you already presented at that time. Yeah, so I'm raising expectations, you can hear now. <laughs> it will be, be great. Be great. Um, Last thing I, I want to say is, is some few practical issues. Please mute yourself uh, during the presentation. And um, after the presentation, uh, if you have a question uh, for Philippa and you, or you want to comment something, please write in the chat. And, and uh, together with Sarah, uh, we will try to update and, and, uh, and take care that the discussion runs in a, in a smooth way where everybody has the opportunity to, um, to, to pose a question if they have this interest within the time limit, of course. I think this is about it. Last thing I should remember to say is that uh, Sarah will also in uh, the chat uh, show you the, uh, the, the contact information for, um, for our research units because our plans are that in the autumn we will continue to to arrange different seminars like this. And if you're interested, uh, this will be the way to, to keep updated. Uh, I can't see Sarah here anymore, actually. Did she? Oh, you're there, Sarah. you're just beside me. Okay. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah. So Sarah, you will, you will post the Facebook uh, contact information if, if people want to join that way. Okay, so Philippa, I'll give you and, and I'll say once again, if, if somebody came in a bit late that I'm recording, um, and then I will give the word to you, Philippa. We're looking forward. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Susanna. Um, I'd like to begin by just acknowledging that I'm working, dancing and speaking on indigenous land here in Melbourne, otherwise known as Nam, the land of the Wurundjeri and Boon people and to acknowledge that Indigenous sovereignty has never been ceded. And this is, this is and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd also like to say thank you to the University of Southern Denmark, who's hosted me for some years now and allowed me to become an honorary professor where I got to make up my own title in uh, dance and philosophy of the body. I love it when I can make up my own title and it's really been wonderful to visit and to be affiliated. All of which, well, most of which, thank you, Jorgen, I owe to Susanna who um, invited me to come along and has invited me to collaborate and suck me into her projects and whatever and it's really been terrific so I just want to say a big thank you to Susanna and also to the movement and culture group which is kind of all part of our conversation today and I'd just like to say hello to all of you thank you for waking up 
um, and uh, coming along. And it's lovely to see people I know and it's lovely to see some people I don't yet know. So thank you for coming. So I'd like to begin by setting the scene a little through speaking to the project and shape of the book, the way in which it moves between philosophy and dance, concepts and practice towards a corporeal conception of the moving dancing body. Then I'm going to outline the two paradigms of the book each of which offers a different way of thinking about the activity of dancing. Finally, to settle today on the second paradigm. I understand people have been offered a couple of chapters of the book to read as background, but I'm going to speak as if you haven't read the text. Even if you have, I'm hoping that our discussion today will make the thinking behind the work more available and also potentially more adaptable to your concerns, insights and practices. So to begin, the project of this book is to reconsider the parameters through which we might think the body in dance. The first half of the book is centered on the corporeality of the dancer. It represents a subject-centered, subject-based approach to the body in dance. The second half focuses on the dancing without recourse to questions of subjectivity, at least in the first instance. It represents an approach to the body in dance, which draws on the plurality of forces as a way of approaching the activity of dancing and its apprehension. So two models, one centered on the subject, one that speaks of forces and their relations as a way of thinking about the body. I see this book as adjacent to the field of dance studies, informed by its concerns, but pursuing its own conceptual trajectory. As a field, Dance studies has historically focused on questions of representation, politics, and power. To that end, dance is often socially and culturally located and historically informed. Its meanings and significations framed in relation to social relations, differences, subjectivities, and kinesthetic forms of difference. The focus on representation has its origins in the linguistic paradigm, inaugurated through Saussure and extended into semiotics. Over time, and through the emergence of cultural studies, the linguistic emphasis on difference was allied to Marxist theories of culture and feminist critiques of sexual difference. Cultural studies has moved on since those early days, incorporating post-colonial theory, critiques of globalization, intersexual, intersectional understandings of race, class and gender, and queer theory, all of which offer a nuanced approach to the specificity of embodied practices. I locate my writing along these axes of difference, but I'm less interested in the workings of representation, for example, the meanings and subject positions embedded in the dance, than in how we might construe the actions of the dancing body. I want to carry with me the political motivations that inform the field of dance and cultural studies as a whole, to retain the notion of difference in relation to power and politics, but I would like to approach them through the body, through what it is that a body does from the point of view of the body. Writing from the point of view of the body is a located endeavor. My own located perspective is informed by my kinesthetic background and culture, the people I dance with, my mentors and teachers, where I dance, the work I've seen and reviewed, 
the somatic practices I engage in and the bodies I've rolled around with. I write about work that I've encountered in some way, shape or form. In the first part of my book, which is focused on the genealogy of the dancer, I theorise the emergence of the body as a perceptual site of the encounter. So perception is a key element here. Also, I think about the body here as a filter in the apprehension of difference. If we think of perception as having a history in practice and in culture, then its specificity tied to the body will have a particular cultural flavour, literate in relation to some modes of practice, unfamiliar in relation to others. That's what I mean by filter, that our perception has a bodily, cultural, social history and that this impacts on what we're able to see. Add to that, the institutional and discursive investment in certain kinds of perception, then issues of power and perception arise in the form of normative dominant kinesthetic values, authorised modes of perception and institutional investments posed within an intercultural globalised setting of exchange, evaluation, funding and commodification. I lead up to such a discussion through the phenomenological lens of Merleau-Ponty, which provides a basis for thinking the emergence of dancerly subjectivity and agency. What I call the dancer's movement subjectivity arises by virtue of the trace of practice on the body and its embedded modes of agency, perception and attention. This is a temporal process. It happens over time through practice to shape and format the kinds of perception that we might find embedded within a particular body. I find Sean Gallagher's discussion of body image and body schema particularly useful in tracing the legacy of practice at the level of disposition, awareness and habit. To avoid a fully deterministic or mechanistic notion of practice, I resort to the work of cultural theorist David Morley to amplify the selective uptake of practice in the body. In other words, even though we might want to think of perception and movement subjectivity as the result of practice, I don't think that you can just read off a mode of practice to say, this is what we'll end up with. This is the kind of subject, this is the kind of perception that we'll have. People bring their own histories to the practical interface, their interests, concerns, and signature tendencies. While Gallagher's distinction between body image and body schema allows us to discern the emergence and deployment of somatic modes of attention alongside the acquisition of skills and habits, Morley's work allows us to see that the singular workings of practice to produce elements of movement subjectivity are modulated by the individual's particular attitudes, history and provenance. My discussion in this part of the book clusters around the production and emergence of the dancer, her agency, skills and habits, leading towards an understanding of the sense in which embodiment implies a distinctive somatic mode of attention native to certain environments and foreign to others. Perception is the means whereby movement is perceived, one's own and others. It functions as a window, also as a filter, blind to its own tendencies, values and specificities. Donna Haraway's notion of situated knowledge 
gives expression to this limitation. Also, the political implications of imagining one has 360 degree vision. The politics of perceptual specificity arise where certain modes of perception are authorized, blind to their own particularity, and yet deployed to evaluate, judge, and classify the work of others. This is, for example, felt today in an Australian context where contemporary dance sensibilities meet non-Western and Indigenous First Nations dance forms. Where colonial relations persist and contemporary dance is unmarked and predominantly white, the recent entry of different lineages raises issues of perception, hegemony, hierarchy and authority. How is work perceived and by whom, according to what kinds of kinesthetic value and literacy? This is becoming more of an issue here since the Black Lives Matter movement and a more conscious pursuit of diversity in dance is underway. It's one thing to program work, another, however, to create a new context for work to be seen. The limits of these conversations around movement subjectivity, kinesthetic sensibility, power relations and, and the perception of difference cluster around the trope and figure of the dancer's subjectivity and the embodiment of perception. The conversation thus far has been conducted entirely on what Deleuze and Guattari might call the plane of the subject, expressed through paying attention to the genealogy of the dancer, the specificity and production of somatic modes of awareness, the kinesthetic milieu, the perceptual encounter, and so on. Although presented in summary form, my reason for doing so was to give you a sense of the way in which I construe an embodied, subject-centered, corporeal, practice-based approach to the activity and practice of dancing, also to indicate the ways in which a politics of difference might be articulated through a subject-centered paradigm of lived corporeality. So, sorry, just got to kick the noise down there. I want now to canvas my second corporeal paradigm, which draws on a very different notion of corporeality. Such an approach resonates with a number of anti-humanist post-structural approaches which begin by questioning the veracity of experience while focusing instead on the social and political production of subjectivity. So where the first approach that I take in the book based on phenomenology really takes experience as a ground and then I look at the way in which practice can can be embodied and construct certain modes of experience, this different paradigm of the body and therefore way of thinking about dance begins by questioning experience as some kind of epistemological ground. It says, well, yes, we do have experience, but really it's produced by other factors, social factors, cultural factors, political factors. These approaches in anti-humanism and post-structuralism in the field of cultural studies are connected with the Marxist theory of ideology, which seeks to explain the production of consciousness as the product of relations of power. They offer a de-centered notion of subjectivity, displace the epistemological priority of the subject while exerting and paying attention to other forms of social, political and cultural influence. So it's a very different way of thinking about the subject that doesn't start 
with what do we know through subjectivity, but really how is subjectivity produced? That's the general tenor of these sort of modes of social and cultural analysis. Like these modes of social inquiry, Nietzsche also displaces the field of subjectivity in favour of an emphasis on other factors. Nietzsche denies the veracity of our lived sense of agency and responsibility, claiming instead that we are not the doers behind the deed. For Nietzsche, experience is a veneer, a surface, beneath which lie a plurality of impulses, drives and instincts. So his genealogical approach seeks to unearth these hidden processes that lie beneath the surface of experience. His work, The Genealogy of Morality, presents a genealogy of modern subjectivity, tracing the origins of our sense of choice, agency, morality and responsibility. So these approaches and with Nietzsche, it's not a denial of the nature and tenor of our experience, but a claim that these experiences are really produced through underlying elements and forces. And a work like The Genealogy of Morality is an attempt to say, what are these things that have produced our sense of agency and um, responsibility? My discussion of Nietzsche draws on the corporeal moments of his philosophy as distilled by Deleuze and interpreted by Deleuze in his book, Nietzsche and Philosophy. What follows is, I hope, a gentle introduction to the unfamiliar terrain of bodies and forces, the two key terms of this paradigm bodies and forces, through to my own adaptation of these concepts to the terrain of dance. The discussion is divided into two parts. First, a picture of the body in Nietzsche. The second, an overview of the ways in which I flesh out the Nietzschean approach. My fleshing out is informed by the sorts of things that I do somatic practices such as Alexander Technique, idiokinesis, Feldenkrais and body-mind centering, studio-based movement with a sensory focus, postmodern techniques of composition and decomposition and improvisation. The way I polemically put the Nietzschean shift away from subjectivity or through questioning subjectivity, is to ask whether we can subtract the dancer from the dance. That is, is it possible to think about the activity of dancing as something that occurs apart from the agency of the dancer? In order to even think like this, and it is counterintuitive, requires a shift from the notion of being, from the notion of subjects and objects, towards a more dynamic version of events grounded in the concept of becoming. The body is posed within, within this picture of dynamic change, of becoming as itself a mode of movement. So rather than a body that moves because we move, there is a new kind of sense of the body put forward here, which sees the body as itself movement. So not something or someone who moves, rather a form of movement taking corporeal form. And here's the thing with bodies and forces. Deleuze defines such a body, this form of movement, as that which forms when forces enter into relation. 
So this is a definition of the body. It says that we don't have a body as a kind of single identity. It's composed of forces, not one single thing, more than one thing in relation. And through that relation, the body emerges as movement. This is our starting point. The view that the body is not a singular entity, the embodied identity we feel it to be, rather a formation based upon plurality, on the difference and relation between forces. Also, that the body emerges through forces entering into relation. The body is thus a movement, a mode of becoming. So rather than begin with the being of the body, the body is conceived as a form of becoming, as that which arises when forces enter into relation. So this kind of picture, it's not just one set of forces coming into relation, it's actually a picture of changing configurations of force and different ones coming into play and other ones and the relationship evolving and changing. And through that, you have the movement and a kind of successive movement of bodily being, which you might see as the event or, you know, in other terms might be thought of as the event. Force is a very general term which can be interpreted in multiple ways, depending upon the kind of body we're talking about. For Deleuze, a body can be biological, social, political, or geological. The human body is a special case within this wide field of definition, a multiplicity of coexisting processes, arrangements, functions, and modes of organization. When forces enter into relation, they generate a body, which is itself a form of movement, the movement from one becoming state to the next. Pierre Klesowski sees the body in this field of thought as a series of corporeal states, the provisional resolution of contestatory forces, taking shape, then giving way to new modes of formation. What is a force? A force is a factor, a tendency, a trajectory, unformed and indeterminate, indeterminate until and unless it finds corporeal form through relating to another force. Nietzsche uses terms such as drive, instinct, impulses and affect to signify the influence and action of underlying elements. The key point here is that force, impulse, affect, and so on, take shape in relation to other forces, affects, and impulses. So the body kind of represents um, a kind of relationship between these different moments or trajectories, which become actual or emerge through their relationship with other elements. The, dyna the dynamism of the relationship between forces is what impels or provokes corporeal formation. The body now a form of mobility and relationality. For Nietzsche, the body is galvanized through the activity of particular forces upon others. The relationship of forces is not symmetrical it's not the product of mutual cooperation, but is rather characterized through difference, through forces playing different roles in the particular instance. For Nietzsche, via Deleuze, all bodies consist of an asymmetric relation between its constituent forces, where one force, called active force, plays a provocative, shaping role and another reactive force plays a responsive interactive role. Active force is the shaping side of things, that which imposes forms, provokes and impels corporeal change. Reactive force is that which responds, whether through accommodation, partnering 
or resistance. But for reactive force, active force would have nothing to work with. But for active force, reactive force would have nothing to respond to. So these two trajectories or impulses together constitute a body. So we've gone from here's a body, not a single thing, composed of forces in relation to each other, and there isn't a sense in which they're all just pals coming together where the sum is greater than the parts. There's a different aspect to the way in which forces relate. There's one aspect of force that is, that imposes, that selects other elements, that gives shape to something. And another aspect that either accommodates or resists or responds to that active shaping. These are the sort of two terms in this mode of analysis. These two terms or aspects of becoming and their emergent relation characterize all forms of corporeality in the sense that there is in this sense of the body something that moves it forwards, that is brings it about in the passage of time in tandem with another aspect of force that meets and partners this forward impulse according to its own specific response. So active and reactive force, they're relational terms that emerge in the specific instance. So it's, there isn't a sense in this kind of ontology or metaphysics that one force is always potentially the active one and another one's always potentially the reactive one. It's the way in which forces together come together to produce the body, it's within that that we can, that we discern this difference, these different aspects of what comes together to produce movement. And in fact, that which was reactive might well in the next moment become active in the shift from one body to the next. So in movement, there's quite the possibility of fluctuating circumstances and, and changing dynamics of relation. So how to understand these abstract terms as that which defines a body? This is entirely a question of interpretation, of identifying the relationality of active and reactive force in the particular corporeal instance, consisting in my case of a series of provisional interpretations as I marshal these concepts towards an interpretation of the dancing body. Here are some examples. Number one, following a single thread of movement. Consider, for example, a plie, allowing gravity to lower towards the floor. Hip sockets opening and extending into turnout, enabling the feet to soften into the floor. Might we say the driving force in this moment, in this movement, is a series of active gestures made in relation to this body as it is in this moment, its capacity and responsiveness as the qualitative opening of this hip, the clear direction of the knees, the complex story of feet and ankles. The key ingredients of this analysis are the identification of that which is active in the moment and that which is reactive. So a question, would we want to say that gravity is active in this movement or not? You know, when you give into a plie, you kind of soften and then you allow things to go down. So what's active here? Is it me? Is it this body, is it the movement that's happening that's somehow offering a shape to the moving or would you say gravity is acting? This is really um, a question of interpretation. In fact, I think it's the problematic of coming to interpret movement in this way. My own response would be to see how gravity works in the particular instance. A circling arm swing may actively direct itself upwards working, actively working gravity, but give in to gravity on the way down in the swing. So, you know, when you do swing an arm, 
it's kind of you sort of work on the up and then you let go on the down so the down's always really fun and you sort of do a bit of a thing to get up there hence the different muscular textures found in an arm swing going up's really different to going down unless of course you're going to control the up and control the down so I am thinking of an arm swing where you're kind of releasing to gravity. Consider a fall in which the body's movement is a responsive management to the workings of gravity. Ramsey Burt offers a really nice account of Nancy Stark Smith falling in contact improvisation. If the beginning of the fall represents the activity of gravity on this momentary body, the skillful management of the fall to me represents a degree of activity that works gravity towards its own ends. The boundaries of the Nietzschean body need not conform to our own corporeal envelope, you know, a bit the skin marking the difference. The back and forth of a counterbalance could be seen as the successive incarnation of a shared body moving between, sharing weight, shifting weight, managing the forces affiliated with weight, gravity and connection. What do we mean in Qigong when we say we draw qi from the earth? When we sink into and use the floor, what are the corporeal boundaries here? In other words, this kind of definition and approach to the body um, is open to thinking a body formed um, through relationship, which could well be between bodies or spatially or across time, that, that it's kind of open to um, differing modes of interpretation. To work with these concepts, active and reactive force, is to depict the moving body as an event, belonging to a larger family of events, each of which consists of one factor activating and giving shape to another, which for its part gives quality and texture to the movement. Deleuze defines active force in a way which I found very fruitful, where he defines or speaks of active force as the imposition or creation of corporeal form through the exploitation of circumstance through exploiting circumstance. What I like about this definition is the invitation to think about the circumstances of dance, of the body, from moment to moment, but also from milieu to milieu. Included in the notion of circumstance, I would put training, background, technique, provenance, also kinesthetic setting, performance habitus, social and political milieu, and the momentary surrounding qualities that arise in and through moving. Equally, choreographic work may work with or against dominant aesthetic norms to create new performative practices. In other words, um, choreography might work in a certain context, maybe within certain traditions or norms or techniques. And these traditions and norms and contexts, they're all a kind of circumstance. And then you might look at a particular form of choreographic work as working these elements as its mode of circumstance. Or virtuosic dancing takes the givens of a field and twists it into fine dancing. Traditional forms are taken and reinterpreted, drawing in contemporary elements, all examples of actively working circumstance. Australian Indigenous company Bangara Dance has historically put together modern dance techniques in conjunction with indigenous forms to perform on the proscenium arch stage. Artistic director Stephen Page has expressed frustration at Bangara's not fulfilling colonial anthropological expectations, 
rather than allowing for Bangara's distinctive combination of modern, contemporary and indigenous elements. So when performing in a white performance context, Bangara could be seen as actively working colonial codes of performative and performativity and spectatorship to its own ends, or as itself reacting to dominant colonial practices. In other words, I think there's many things in which you might argue one kind of reading or another kind of reading, and you might say, well, this work, it's got reactive elements, or I can see the active element of this. This is sort of the field of interpretation within this conceptual domain. The circumstances of the body shift from moment to moment. The excitement of live performance hails from the risk and opportunity that arises from these changing circumstances. As Susanna Raven has argued, albeit in a different conceptual milieu, all dancing has an improvisatory character represented here in the play between forces and in their manner of articulation. The becoming body, to use Erin Manning's terminology, affiliated with any one event could be small, part of a greater human multiplicity, corporate body, or a whole domain. For example, the movement of the field of dance its incorporation of tradition, political force, constituent bodies and institutional practices. I've just sort of had come to mind, um, there's an American choreographer who has a work, um, Faye Driscoll, I think it's called, uh, it's in a number of parts, but there's one called Thank You For Coming. And it starts off with the dancers working together, but in the course of the work, the audience is drawn in to the work to, fight, to sort of create a kind of corporate political body. And um, there's been a, a few works that I've seen in Melbourne where people are trying to construct a larger body through the work. And there's this kind of process of incorporation of spectator incorporation to create a larger body. And in a way, you know, you could see like the audience is comprising a circumstances of the work and then the work is kind of actively working with that. I've recently come out of a creative development of a work with Priya Srinivasan called S3 um, about violence against women, drawing from the rape and murder of Indian student Jyoti Singh in 2012. This is a work which plays with Bharatanatyam in a postmodern pastiche of installation, projection, traditional Hindu song, dancing, and a performative virtual citation of classical Hindu goddess cosmology. Each moment of the work's passage, its corporeal flow could be seen as actively deploying contemporary, traditional Indian and non-Indian elements, techniques, technologies and circumstances. It could also be said that each moment of its performative reiteration, like in performance, actively engages these set components in the live flow of events. The discussion thus far has been focused on identifying active and reactive force in the particular case of corporeal formation. I've offered a few illustrations from the iterative singularity of the moving body to the formative corporeality of multiple bodies through to the wider sense in which choreography works norms and codes, but is also subject to dominant norms of presentation and spectatorship in the serial creation of a dance work. All these examples are all too brief illustrations of the ways in which I think about the becomings of force in the conceptual terms offered thus far. As Deleuze has noted, 
it is difficult to think of the event in terms of the activity of force upon other forces when we're so used to thinking about action from the point of view of the subject. I think that all forms of thought that run counter to common sense struggle both to make sense, but also to make their case. In the case of Nietzsche and Deleuze, the reconceptualization of the body into a transitory plural phenomenon is both challenging to think beyond our sense and experience of action and agency, but also issues an invitation to open to a wider plurality of constitutive moments. Cultural studies has more generally resisted the idea that the social and political is an external force, something that works on the outside of the individual, positing the formation of subjectivity within and according to discursive practices. Foucault's notion of subjectification and inscription, for example, looks in the first instance to the effects of practice on the body to create a particular sense and experience of self. I haven't yet gone into the way in which the self is reconceptualized within the Deleuzean Nietzschean framework. It's a long story, so I'm going to try to zoom out on Zoom to give you some sense of its treatment and discussion. In On the Genealogy of Morality, Nietzsche writes that there's no doer behind the deed. Deleuze makes sense of this provocative claim by suggesting that all interiority arises through force turning inwards. Furthermore, that it is not interiority per se that is the problem of subjectivity, but rather its retention by way of memory. Insofar as we entertain experience, turning force inwards, according to this um, account, force is not able to relate to other forces in corporeal form. That's one argument, that forces either turn inwards to form droplets of experience or interact according to corporeal formation. I take this in a number of directions. One, to see what could happen next to experience. Okay, so forces turn inwards to create interiority. Can anything happen to that? To which I say yes. And I do go on about that in the book, but I'll save you from that here as time moves on. But that's one thing that I, I'm interested in looking at. So there's a kind of ontological distinction between the different ways in which forces combine. One to turn inwards to create a sense of interiority, which I think can then be redeployed in action to form a body. Number two, to look at training, technique, habit, capacity building and dispositional um, inculcation as the cultural workings of force to produce certain kinds of bodily subjectivity in which force is organized, ready and able to be deployed. So this second approach is really coming back to what I look at in the first part of the book through phenomenology and through the construction of embodied subjectivity, but here to look at how we might see culture as working force to inculcate um, a sense of disposition within a kind of bodily mode of organization. And three, to think about the ways in which dancerly subjectivity is treated as problematic at the level of practice. So this is where I've, Yari, you've got a hand up. No, there's a little hand on your picture. Okay. Um, so the third thing that I do is to look at within practice to seek out or to, to discuss ways in which within dancing, there is a sense in which the dancing self 
can be a bit of a problem. Number one, in relation to overcoming habit. Number two, in relation to postmodern performative modes of decentered subjectivity. And that's in that I talk about um, Yvonne Rayner and Trio A and discussions around that. And three, where the givens of familiar kinesthetic sensibility are explicitly avoided through postmodern choreographic techniques of composition, decomposition and recomposition. So insofar as in some kind of postmodern uh, choreographic modes of, of invention, rather than creating choreography through something that might feel good to do or that this body is kind of able to do or will do, taking these arbitrary kind of strategies of cutting up, reversing, suturing and resuturing as a way of kind of moving beyond the givens of a particular embodied sensibility. These examples I discuss in relation to the Nietzschean concept of overcoming. I explore them as a way of amplifying within this conceptual domain the ways in which performative practice can at times decenter and displace the knowing subject of dance. Well, that's it from me, more or less. Um, in this window of time, and thank you for your patience, I've sketched the ways in which I look at dance from a subject-centered phenomenological perspective and from a Nietzschean Deleuzean reconceptualization of the body. In the first instance, dancing is the work of the dancer. In the second, dancing ensues from the workings of force. In the first instance, we begin with the subject. In the second, with the formation of a body through relations of force. The merits of sticking close to experience are the insights that it can deliver as a collective intersubjective project of corporeal understanding. To approach dance through the plurality of force is to open up to a decentered dynamic notion of becoming, one which can call upon a wide diversity of forces in accounting for the dance. Rather than argue one against the other, I'm interested in what a family of concepts makes possible, how each conceptualizes the body in motion and how that interacts with the field of dance as I know it. Thank you. Thank you, Philippa. Um, that was great. Uh, now I will stop uh, recording and we will open uh, for the discussion. So you will not be recorded uh, in, in the discussion just to, to the listeners.